Welcome to How Leaders Lead, where every week you get to listen in while I interview some of the very best leaders in the world. I break down the key learnings so that by the end of the episode, you'll have something simple that you can apply as you develop into a better leader. That's what this podcast is all about. And today's guest is Larry Merlot, CEO of CVS Health. Larry is just an incredible leader. And when he took the helm of CVS in 2011, they were doing about $100 billion in revenue. Now that's a lot of money, but guess what? Now they're doing almost $250 billion in revenue. That's just a remarkable level of growth. But it's not the most remarkable thing Larry has done. He also made the bold and honestly risky decision to remove tobacco products from CVS stores. And he did that even though they accounted for $2 billion of revenue. He'll tell you the whole story, and it's incredible. But I really want you to listen for why he and his team made that decision in the first place. It came from a very simple statement of the purpose of their company. Literally eight words, and it changed everything for them. As leaders, we all need the reminder, the best vision in the world ain't worth a lick if our team can't connect with it and apply it each and every day. This conversation with Larry shows us just how to communicate our big ideas in simple, compelling terms. So here's my conversation with my good friend and soon to be yours, Larry Merlot. Well, Larry, I appreciate you being on this show so much. And you know what? I was, I, I know I've been looking at your career. You know, you, you became CEO nine years ago. And back then, CVS, I think, had a little over $100 billion in revenue. And today, it's $265 billion. You now have uh, over 300,000 employees, and you're number five on the Fortune 500 list. And to think, you started out as a pharmacist. Uh, tell us about that journey. Well, you know, David, it, uh, it it brings back a lot of memories. I, I, I grew up in a in a small uh, mill town, uh, there was actually a Corning Glassworks plant that most people worked at. And if they didn't work there, they worked at the Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel Plant across the river. And I loved music. I loved chemistry. And I actually had a high school chemistry teacher that I think the world of to this day. And he actually steered me in the direction of pharmacy. Larry, if you, if you like chemistry and, and you like medicine, you know, think about pharmacy as a career. And off I went to uh, the University of Pittsburgh and, and, uh, and five years later, I uh, graduated as a pharmacist. You, you know, you moved up the ladder from the pharmacist to the CEO. How did you distinguish yourself and show that you had broader potential? That's a great question. And, and uh, you know, oftentimes you get that question, that, well, when you started, did you have aspirations to be CEO? And, and my answer was no, I really had aspirations to be the very best pharmacist. And as you got into that environment, you saw opportunities for growth. And I had always set my goal in terms of, well, I went from being a pharmacist to getting into management and field management and operations. And I think one of the things that helped shape my learnings is that I was never afraid to raise my hand for a special assignment. And maybe it didn't result in a promotion, but it actually took me out of my comfort zone. And through the various experiences that I had, it actually taught me about things that were not core to my experience or my background. And I think a lot about that. And, and I think if I didn't have had those opportunities or took advantage of them, I, I don't see myself being in the role that I'm in today. Did you have, Larry, when you were taking on those special assignments, did you have one of those that really sort of changed your career trajectory? When I graduated from pharmacy school, I went to work for a drug chain that many will remember in the Washington, D.C. area called People's Drug. It was actually founded in 1904, and this is now 1978, and had a wonderful experience there. And 12 years later, the CVS actually acquired the People's Drug chain. That's, you know, that's how I got to CVS. And through consolidation activities, which we can all appreciate, um, I found myself as the most senior person that remained in the Washington, D.C. area. Hmm. And that dynamic really helped you know, shape, I would describe, my leadership because now 
I recognized that, okay, we were part of this new company. There were many things that CVS did differently than, than people's, many things that were very positive and some things that, you know, oh, this isn't going to work in the Washington, D.C. market. And I found myself playing that role, that leadership role in terms of how do I help educate my boss and our new owners in terms of things that I think may be contradictory to that particular marketplace. And at at the same time, provide leadership for at the time, uh, about 10,000 of our new CBS colleagues in terms of the leadership that they needed in terms of how are they going to accept some of the changes that we were all going to be better as a result of what we were collectively doing as, as a leadership team. So, you know, I learned an awful lot from that. Well, you certainly have a, a company now that requires integration. I want to get to that a little bit later. But, you know, I know you you really think a lot about leadership, Larry. Uh, can you tell us a couple stories a, a, about your personal guiding principles of leadership? Because, I, you know, I understand that, uh, you know, doing a little homework, that you actually have 10 guiding principles. We don't have time for 10. But do you have a couple stories on, on a few of the main ones that uh, you could share with us? Yeah, and you brought up the the ten, and you know when I became CEO, that was back in in uh, in early two thousand eleven, and I still remember it was a Sunday night, and and I'm thinking a lot about you know how do I get started? It's an organization that I know, and and it's an organization that our colleagues know know me and who I am, but obviously I was succeeding a very successful individual. My predecessor had been in that role for more than 15 years and was very well respected across the organization. And how do I get our colleagues to see me in a different light as the CEO? And that was the question that I was really wrestling with. And I still remember that Sunday evening, just scribbling a whole bunch of random thoughts. And those thoughts ended up being 10 things that I believe in, that I think have helped shape me as as a leader. And, and and David, one of those stories is I think about finding the sweet spot between being student and being a teacher. And yeah, you know, and I think the higher you you move up in any organization, I think there's an expectation that you have all the answers. And the reality is as the CEO, you don't. And I believe a strong leader takes pride in being both a student and a teacher. And being that student means that you're displaying humility, okay? And at the same time, uh, you're a good listener. And it's something that I have really tried to stay true to. And sometimes it's hard because in times of crisis, people do expect you, well, Larry's going to have the answer. He's going to know exactly what we need to do. And there are times when you have to turn around and, and, and acknowledge that, look, I don't have the answer, but here's what we need to solve for. And here's how we're going to go about doing that. And I have found that that guiding principle has, you know, has served me and I believe served our organization very well. That's fantastic. You know, I just love that. I love the fact that you codified your 10 principles too. The student as teacher is a way how you can solve problems. You know, how do you... How do you take your team through solving a major, major problem? What's your perspective on problem solving? I think oftentimes, and, and look, I'll, I'll raise my hand. You know, I've made the mistake that sometimes you see the problem in front of you and let's move quickly being action oriented. And I've made the mistake sometimes in terms of the desire to, to deal with or to solve whatever issue is on the table that everybody jumps in with both feet and you later realize you solved for the wrong problem. And we talk a lot about, look, take a deep breath, take a few minutes, and make sure that we understand the problem that we really need to solve for. And then the second step is, how do you define the guiding principles in terms of going about that? Because one of the things that I've come to appreciate there, there's so many things that come across our desk that perhaps the playbook has not been written and you're charting a new, uh, a new path forward. That's especially true at CVS as, as we have worked to reinvent ourselves and change our business model to be more, not be more, be a health services company. And we spend a lot of time, what are the guiding principles that we will move forward to solve whatever is on the table? And 
We use those guiding principles as our guideposts, kind of our roadmap that as we're dealing with the unknown, I, I find myself oftentimes going back to those guiding principles and how many of those can I check the box on? And, and you know, if, if the answer is none, then that tells me I'm, I'm on the wrong road. Okay. If the answer is no, you know what? I might not have checked every box, but I'm moving down the right road and, and let's keep going. I love that idea of, of taking a deep breath. You know, <laughs> there's so many times I could tell you when I, I just went charging ahead and needed to take a little bit of a time out. When you became CEO, a lot of us, we, we get into these new jobs. And what was the biggest anxiety you had to work through when you became the, the, the new CEO? You know, I think one of the things that, uh, that we wrestled with, uh, and, and some of this goes back to what we were just talking about in terms of our evolving strategy as a health services company, I remember you know, sitting down and looking at, uh, at the time, we had our mission statement and our vision statement. As I think back on that, uh, I, you know, we made the mistake of involving, you know, the consultants. And, and look, there are times where consultants are invaluable and there are times where, you know what, you don't need a consultant. And if you're going to do it right, you need to do it from within. And we had these very carefully worded paragraphs. And when you read them, it felt like we were solving for world hunger. And I could remember one of the very first leadership meetings that we had. Um, you know, we had about 400 people in the room and, and I put up the two paragraphs and I asked everyone, which one is the mission? Which one is the vision? You got a 50% chance of getting it right. And back then we were using our phones to, to do the, uh, the, the question, okay? And that's exactly what we got. 50% of the people got it right, okay? And, you know, and I still remember in that meeting making a commitment that, look, this is the last time you're going to see this mission and this vision because we haven't been able to operationalize it in terms of bringing, you know, uh, a, a day-to-day meaning to our work. And, you know, if we can't answer that question as the leadership of the company, then how good a job are we doing leading the thousands of individuals that are counting on us, okay, for that level of, uh, of leadership and focus and direction? So we took a very small group of our colleagues and we said, here's the challenge. And they did an absolute fantastic job. They came back and said, Larry, we need a purpose. And that purpose is one sentence. And this was back in 2011, and, and that purpose, it, it, it still stands to this day that our purpose as a company is helping people on their path to better health. That's, and, that's so simple. You know, it, it, it's simple. You know, it's understood by everyone. And David, I, I, I knew that we, that we hit the mark, and you know, I was out you know, uh, visiting our stores, and I still remember this uh, vividly. Uh, we were in Long Island, and walked into the store with the region manager and I had observed one of our uh, one of our colleagues you know, was helping an elderly customer taking bags out to her car. So our employee comes back and I introduced myself and and I said, look, I, I just want to take a minute to thank you. I said I observed what you were doing in terms of you know, that was great and thanked him and and the employee said to me, well, it's my way of helping people on their path to better health. Okay, now this was someone who wasn't working in the pharmacy. They were working in what we call the front of store and they were able to internalize you know, what those words meant as to the job that they were doing you know, every day. And I tell that story often because helping people on their path to better health, someone thinks, well, if I'm not filling a prescription or seeing a patient in one of our clinics or some of the other health related areas where you are providing health advice or healthcare treatment and there are countless examples out there like that where people have internalized that in a, in very meaningful ways I love the fact that you talked about the consultants had the first one you know they, it was all laminated but nobody really could internalize it and it's really interesting because I think the great visions are ones that you can understand and then people can personalize it like you say and say this is how I can make it happen in, in, in my piece of uh, CVS health so I can see how that really works you know Larry 
great leaders have to make courageous calls. And, you know, tell us the story of how you made the decision. I remember hearing this, actually, it was in a in my own boardroom when people were talking about it, and it was in the Wall Street Journal. It, it, you became the first major retailer to take tobacco products out of your stores. Tell us how you thought through that whole process. Yeah, it, it, we talked earlier about our longer-term strategy was we wanted to be more of a healthcare company. And that was being defined, and there were things that we were doing, uh, whether it was opening what today is called meta clinics in our stores or some of the things that we were doing in in our pharmacies that went beyond just filling a prescription. And we now own a pharmacy benefit management company and the synergy that could be created across those two businesses. And I could remember going to several meetings with various health professionals. It could have been an integrated delivery system and and would be talking about some of the things that we could do, you know, recognizing our local presence and the fact that, you know, we we would see millions of customers every day in our in our retail pharmacies. And we would be having great conversations and halfway, two thirds of the way through the conversation, someone would speak up and, and say, well, Larry, but CBS sells tobacco, right? And that drumbeat it played out more times than not in those meetings. And, and David, what, what I found was the enthusiasm and the energy that was in the room. When that question got asked, it just sucked all the air out of the room. You felt like you wanted to crawl under the table. And oftentimes, the meetings ended with, thanks for coming. And that was a very interesting conversation. And the follow-up was, yeah, we were really never able to get any momentum from those, uh, from those discussions. And I could remember uh, coming back among our uh, our leadership team, and we started talking about that. And at the time, we generated about two billion dollars of revenues. And and what we were looking at was there was about a billion and a half of tobacco sales. And then as we looked at what else did folks buy as part of a purchasing a pack of cigarettes, you know, you would see gum or or mints and. Yeah, and the reality was you could see that those purchases, people were thinking of us more as a convenience store. So there was $2 billion worth of revenues at stake, but we were having the discussion that, look, here's our strategy. Here's our long-term strategy. This absolutely has proven to be a barrier in terms of getting any traction. I remember we put a whole presentation together. We very quietly went out and surveyed some health professionals. And the one thing that I was extremely concerned about is that hopefully everyone is you know shopped in a CVS pharmacy, but we sell candy, uh, we sell chips, we sell soda, and and uh, and we even sell you know spirits and alcohol in states where it's permitted. And I, I was concerned in terms of well, if we stop selling tobacco, where would it stop? Would it spill into those products? And and I I did get comfortable in talking to health professionals. When you ask that question, they turned around and said, Larry, stop right there. There is no amount of tobacco use that could be considered safe. The other products that you rattled off, yes, there are challenges in in our society around obesity, but those products taken in moderation have not been proven to cause the medical harm that tobacco does. And they were essentially saying, we got your back on. I remember going to our board and that was a very, very sleepless night before that board. And <laughs> I can imagine $2 billion know, as, in revenue. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, as you might expect, I had socialized the thought with some of the, uh, I'll say the key leaders on our board and had gotten their feedback. And, and David, it, it's probably a, a board meeting that I'll never forget because the support from the board was unprecedented. It ended up becoming a very quick conversation. And I still remember one of our board members saying, Larry, look, it's the right thing to do. And one of the things that I want to emphasize is don't be shy about telling the story. Just go out there and you've got nothing to be embarrassed about in terms of walking away from $2 billion. You'll, you'll be challenged. You know, the investor community will scratch their head. Okay. And you're going to talk about our journey as a healthcare company. I vividly remember not just that meeting, but what transpired shortly after, because we put the plan together. And I remember it was in February of 2014, where we did some embargoed interviews with 
the key newspapers across the country. And there was myself, our chief medical officer, our, our head of marketing. And, you know, and after the second or third interview, I, I remember asking folks, I said, hey, there's a theme that's emerging here. And it didn't matter who we were talking to. At the end of the interview, the reporter wanted to tell you their story about how tobacco impacted their life. Hmm. And it usually involved a family member. And they told the story like it happened yesterday, even though it could have happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. We were able to take that thought, both internally and externally, with our employees, as well as the communities at large, in terms of tell us your story. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, and that accompanied with programs that we put in place in terms of how we could help people who wanted to stop using tobacco products, it, it takes an individual on average seven times before they're successful in terms of kicking the tobacco habit. There was a tremendous, tremendous outpouring of you know, our employees, uh, the communities at large, uh, in terms of support for that decision. And as I look back on that, it, it, it's, it's one of the, you know, uh, it'll be one of the highlights of my career. Uh, because it removed that barrier. And I look at all the things that we've been able to do as a healthcare company since 2014 that I think back and I, I'm confident that I know many of those doors would never have been opened had we not made that decision. When did you make the decision, Larry, to go to CVS Health? You know, it, it, David, we, we made the decision shortly thereafter because you know, it was interesting. We made the announcement in, uh, in February 14, as I mentioned, at the time, we had about 7,600 stores. So we said we need six months to eliminate tobacco from our stores. We were going to you know, sell down the inventory, et cetera, et cetera. And based on the reaction that we got out of the gate, our corporate identity at the time was CBS Caremark, which there was nothing that resonated to the consumer about that name. And we said, you know what, from the reaction that we got, the learnings that we've got, there is an opportunity to rebrand the company as more of a health company, recognizing that that was the journey that we had begun. Uh, eliminating tobacco was another step in that journey. And there was a lot of things that we also began to do we had a five-year program that we launched called Be the First. Our goal, working with community partners to create the first tobacco-free generation. And we've got a lot of proof points that have demonstrated the progress that we've made there. But six months later, actually five months later, because it was September 3rd, 2014, that we announced that we were tobacco-free. And as part of that announcement, we announced our new corporate name, CBS Health. Huh, great. That's that's a great story. You know, you talked about how everybody has a personal story with tobacco. I understand that you you have a personal story. Your father died from cancer of a cigarette related disease. Yeah, David, he was uh my father passed away at uh at a young age. He was fifty seven, uh mm. died of cancer. He worked in the glass factory and he chewed tobacco during the day and he smoked cigars in the evening. So he either had a, a, a chew going, okay, or that cigar was uh, was attached to his lips, whether it was lit or not. Uh, <laughs> and look, he was a wonderful individual. And I regret the fact that he died at such a young age. And the time that that took away from the two of us being able to spend time together as uh, you know, myself as a young adult and uh, think about sure. him often. Yeah, I'm sure you do. You know, and now, Larry, as you've evolved as a, a, a health services company, You've got a really interesting model. It's totally unique in the industry. It's an interconnected model where you have over 10,000 pharmacies. You've got Aetna Insurance. You've got a pharmacy benefit management company. How are you bringing this whole company together? And, and what's your vision here? Well, the vision is, you know, uh, obviously everyone sees the challenges that exist in our healthcare system today. It's, it's, it's very uh, it's very complicated and can be confusing to to access and, and and navigate and and it's become you know very costly and and unfortunately unaffordable for many. And as we think about how we can change the way care is delivered in the country, we we really think about you know three imperatives that are associated with that. And you know the first one is to make healthcare local and to meet people where they are, whether it's in their community. 
in their home or now in the palm of your hand. Uh, the second is to make healthcare simple. And we believe that you know, we can provide uh, the information and the navigation so you know, people can, can access what they need and the resources that they need to make uh, an informed decision. And the third, and, and we think about this one, David, as, as being our North Star, and go, go back to that purpose of helping people on their path to better health. And, you know, you look at uh, today that we got about two-thirds of our country that has one or more chronic diseases. Uh, we know their names. You know, it's hypertension, cardiovascular, diabetes, asthma. You know, and there are eight or nine of those chronic diseases that are accounting for anywhere from 75 to 80 percent of all healthcare costs. And yet those individuals with chronic disease are not achieving uh, their, their best health outcome. And I was sharing this story with, with someone and they stopped me in the middle of it and they said, Larry, it, it, it sounds like you want to cure diabetes. And I said, well, we're, we're not going to be able to cure diabetes. I said, we'll, we'll leave that to the researchers. But we can help the 30 plus million individuals today that have diabetes, we can help them achieve their best health, making sure that they're staying adherent to their medications, they're getting their, the appropriate frequency of blood testing, that they're following the instructions that they may have around you know, diet, nutrition, and exercise. And, and, and David, we look at, at our healthcare system today that that individual may be visiting their physician on a quarterly basis, and, and maybe it's even less frequent, and they leave with that care plan, and the system fails you know, way too many people because no one knows if that care plan is being followed until an unintended consequence happens. And at that point, we would sit here and say it's too late. So those are the imperatives that we have uh, you know, uh, as an organization to you know, change the trajectory of care and, and in doing so, help people achieve a better health outcome and, and at the same time, reduce overall health care costs. The, the, the one thing that has been interesting, and obviously, uh, as a country, we've been dealing with several crises over the last three months and, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic being, you know, front and center for many. And we have seen our strategy come to life in very meaningful ways. And, you know, uh, across you know all three of those dimensions of community in the home and in the hand and you know uh, we've all heard about the need for testing and and we have been able to bring testing into communities uh, you know all across the country we've now tested uh, as we sit here today over 400,000 individuals in communities uh, and we have brought testing into the underserved communities where you know we've seen the population health data where uh, you know the, the the COVID-19 virus is disproportionately affecting, you know, the minority populations. Uh, the, the second thing is we, we've seen the pressure that uh, the pandemic has put on hospitals and we have worked with hospitals. Uh, we actually have a home infusion company to, you know, work collaboratively to discharge patients back into the home, you know, earlier than perhaps uh, they would under normal circumstances. And, We've now made 80,000 visits uh, into individuals' homes providing infusion therapies you know, in the comfort and convenience of their home that would have otherwise been delivered from within the hospital. And we freed up important uh, bed capacity as a result. And then we've seen a dramatic increase in the utilization of, uh, of telemedicine, uh, where people are accessing information, they're accessing uh, care off of their iPads, their iPhones, or their desktops. Uh, so... You know, those are three ways that we have seen our strategy uh, being accelerated as a result of the, uh, the pandemic crisis. Well, Larry, congratulations to you and your team for the great job you've done stepping up with COVID-19. It's, it's been amazing and certainly appreciated by so many. You know, and I thought that you as a leader did an absolutely terrific job working with President Trump to, to help form that private-public partnership to get our, our country through the testing process. How did that how did that come about and, and how did you see your role as a leader during that? I'm glad you brought up uh, you know public private partnership because you know there, there's there's so much that gets discussed about should the government do this, government do this and 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 we talk a lot about you know the role of the private sector and 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 I believe that your question is is a perfect example of 
the importance of public-private partnership, that the government can write the rules and establish the guardrails, if you will, but you know, handing things off to the private sector, I think that's where competition, innovation becomes so important. And the one thing that I would, uh, that I'm extremely proud of is we talk about the work of our CVS colleagues, and I could not be prouder of how they've stepped up, you know, to the challenges that, you know, that, you know, this, you know, has created as a business, but acknowledging that the same challenges that we've all dealt with as individuals in our personal lives, our, our colleagues have been, you know, dealing with those same challenges, but have stepped up and, and done phenomenal things in supporting their customers and, and the communities in which we live and serve. The, the second thing that I'll mention is, you know, within industry, sure, we're, we're competitors, but I'm also very proud of what we have done as an industry. Uh, you know, we've been on the phone many times, uh, sharing our experiences and, and learning from one another. And, you know, all for the betterment of, you know, the, the individuals that we're serving. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's something that, again, uh, we can and should be proud of. And, you know, I, I think something that will carry us forward even after we get this pandemic behind us. And speaking of that, Larry, how are you? Are you doing anything now from a proactive perspective in terms of planning for when we get the vaccine? Well, David, another great question. And, and we're doing a tremendous amount of planning uh, around that. As you think about, let, let's fast forward a, a bit uh, and think about the, the fall time frame because we will have the return of what I'll call the seasonal flu. Uh, that's something that we did not have to deal with back in the March timeframe when, when the pandemic was on us. If you, if you think back to you know, March, the seasonal flu was winding down. And fast forward to the fall and early winter months that when the seasonal flu returns, think about all of us as individuals that you know, we can probably recall a time where we had a mild case of the flu and the sniffles and head cold, and we probably, you know, powered through, came to work, uh, and that's going to be different this time. Yeah, and I think as individuals, as human beings, the first thing we're going to want to check the box on is, okay, I have symptoms. The symptoms are similar. Do I have the seasonal flu or do I have COVID nineteen? And we're going to want to get tested, you know, to bifurcate or to answer that important question. Uh, the second thing, David, that you know, we all talk a lot about, you know, it's time to get your flu shot. And we know less than 40% of individuals you know, get the seasonal flu vaccine. Uh, we went out and surveyed some individuals three, four weeks ago, and well over 60% of individuals said that uh, I'm going to be getting a flu shot this year. It makes sense acknowledging what everyone has been going through over the last few months. So you know, we're planning for, you know, that fall time frame uh, with a real focus on getting as many people vaccinated for the seasonal flu vaccine. Again, continuing to ensure that, you know, our testing capabilities are, you know, are sufficient for, you know, satisfying the need that will be out there. And then, you know, to your point, I think that, you know, we all want to have some optimism that, you know, the, our researchers will crack the code on a COVID vaccine. And, you know, and we'll be ready, uh, again, working with the public sector to, you know, be able to be an access point, uh, you know, for millions of Americans to be vaccinated. Our country, we've been through so much this year, 2020. It, it, we're now in the midst of protests and riots due to the brutal death of, uh, of George Floyd. How has this impacted CVS and, and how have you as a leader uh, stepped up to, to make whatever statement needed to be made for your company? Uh, it's a very important time uh, I, you know, in, in our company and, and in society in general. That, uh, you know, and and uh, there, there, there's something different uh, you know, this time. Uh, you know, it, it, unfortunately, it's another example of, you know, of, of an act of, I'll describe it as, uh, you know, inhumane treatment of an individual that we have seen um, play out multiple times, uh, you know, over the last few years. And, and I know that uh, you know, we've held town hall meetings, we have, you know, colleague resource uh, groups, and, uh, you know, and I've met with our black colleague resource group. And, you know, and look, we've talked openly in terms of what we've seen, uh, 
you know, I believe that there's a different level of transparency that, you know, that exists, you know, in these conversations that we're having. And as the leader of, of CBS, you know, there's a new lens that we're approaching, you know, the, the diversity work that we do and, and a heightened sense of urgency. And, 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 and David, I, in, in listening to colleagues in our organization, you know, one of the things that, you know, we're, we're embarking on, look, we have a lot of programs uh, that are focused on colleague engagement, colleague opportunities, uh, things that we do in the communities to support our communities. And one of the things that we're undertaking is, look, we have an opportunity here to evaluate all the things that we do and, and ask some very important questions. Maybe this goes back to, you know, where we started in terms of taking time to understand what's the issue that we're looking to solve and what are the guiding principles that support those solutions. And we're evaluating all the things that we do, what's working and why is it working? And is there an opportunity to do more and accelerate the benefits that those various programs might be providing? At the same time, what things aren't working? And why aren't they working? How do we fix what may be broken? And then, you know, are there things that are missing? Are there things that we're not doing that, that we need to? It's been very eye-opening for me. Uh, David, I've gotten countless emails from colleagues of all ethnicity, males, females. And, and I think that what we have seen has, I've talked to a lot of our Black employees in terms of what they're feeling, but I've also gotten many emails from individuals who are not Black. And I say that because, David, I, I read these emails and they're self-identifying themselves. I read an email that, you know, Larry, I am a white female uh, and here's where I work. And they talk about, uh, you know, their experience in participating and listening in the town hall. And, 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 and then they talk about things that they want to do to be part of the solution. It has energized me in terms of, um, you know, what I described as a new lens and a heightened sense of urgency to figure out what more we can do. Larry, you're a tremendously visionary leader. I mean, you know, I don't know of too many people who could shape a company like you've shaped it and grow it like you've shaped it. And, you know, tell us about, as you look forward you know, how do you see your, your you've got 10,000 pharmacies. What's your store of the future look like? I've, I've read about, like so many people, your health ups. Talk a little bit about what you're trying to do there. Thanks for asking that because I, I love talking about this one. But, you know, but David, it, it really goes back to, you know, the, the strategy of, of making healthcare local, simple, and what we can do to help individuals, especially those with chronic disease, achieve a better health outcome. And David, I remember wrestling with this discussion that I'm going to go back 40 years. Uh, you know, the, those first stores that I worked in as a pharmacist and then a manager uh, of the store, you know, I had a soda fountain in those stores. And I could remember getting, you know, getting to the store at 6.30 in the morning because you had to fire up the grill because it's 7 a.m., 7.15, you know, you had breakfast on the griddle, okay, and the <laughs> seats were filled, okay. And you know, and, and you've seen how the evolution of pharmacies has taken place. And for years, we wrestled with this question, are we a convenience store that happens to have a pharmacy in the back, or are we a pharmacy that has a convenience offering? And I know that sounds like a very subtle difference, but the answer to those two questions is a mile wide. And as we decided that our future was as a healthcare, a health services company, we answered that question that we're a pharmacy that is uh, that will have a convenience offering. So we're repurposing. We've begun the repurposing of our stores to bring that vision to life. And we think about the role of what we call the front of store. And yep, you have all these health-related items. But we also think about the role of personal care, uh, whether it's dental care products or skin care products, and then beauty. Uh, and you know, those three categories, health, beauty, personal care, uh, they take up about, you know, two thirds of our front store. And there is an element to those categories that today we think about healthcare when, you know, something's wrong. And we, and, you know, it, it, and we sit here a lot and we think about, well, how do you think about health as it relates to wellness? You know, so that 
we can get in front of why do we only think about healthcare when something's broke in our bodies? Okay, and we think about those those products, uh, those categories, and then we also think about what additional services can we bring to our stores. Whether it's the role of our mini clinics and provide for more diagnostic services, so we'll have fifteen hundred of these health hubs, uh, you know, across the country by the end of twenty twenty one. And from the ones that we have up and running, we're we're in six or seven markets at this point. The the feedback from customers has been absolutely terrific, and I believe that we're we're definitely on the right track in terms of meeting an unmet need. Uh, that exists in the eyes of many of our customers today. Yeah, I've always found that if it makes sense from a customer perspective, the operator can really jump on board. And uh, that's, that's that what sounds like that's happening at CVS, which is great news for all. For me as a consumer, I love it. You know, uh, you know Larry, uh, speaking of consumer, you and CVS, you you know the experts say that you're really at the the heart of consumerism in in healthcare, which is a major major new happening. You know, how do you go about you know really identifying consumer needs and gaps and, and innovating? Because you're doing a heck of a lot of it. Well, David, a lot of that is uh, we spend a lot of time listening to our customers, and and uh, look, I've learned through success and failure uh, that. You know, you've really got to be a good listener because our customers, they won't tell us what to do. But if you listen and ask the questions the right way, they'll sure give you an awful lot of insights about what they don't like and what they're frustrated with. And and it becomes our job to take those listening skills to learnings and the learnings to solutions. And that's what we've tried to do, what we're working to do in terms of understanding what those unmet needs are and then bringing solutions. Now, the other thing that is part of that that I I get pretty excited about is I think the role of data, analytics, and technology, I describe it as there's this new intersection that's forming. And the opportunity to, as you look at all of that information and how you can be predictive of, well, wait a minute, something as simple as Larry's on a on a statin for high cholesterol, and he should have had his prescription refilled five days ago, and he hasn't. We need to find out why. And it's amazing what you learn. High cholesterol is largely asymptomatic. You know, so you hear comments like, I didn't feel any different after than I did before, so I didn't think it was working, so why do I want to spend the money for a prescription that's not making a difference? Or you hear about, well, I started getting cramps in my legs and I didn't like those side effects, so I stopped taking it. It's an opportunity to proactively engage and learn all those different things and separate fact from fiction, all with the goal of, again, helping people stay healthy. So, I, David, I would say that we're, that we're in the early innings of triangulating data analytics and, and technology, and that was really the beauty of what made CVS and Aetna coming together as one so powerful that Aetna has a lot of that information resident you know, about the members that they serve. And when you think about the assets that are resident within CVS, that we have an opportunity to face off with those customers because we see them on a regular basis. And that gives you a big advantage, big advantage over the long term. You know, everybody talks about Amazon, which is obviously an incredible company and major, it's disrupted almost every category. You know, how do you see countering them? I mean, you've obviously got the bricks and mortar. Well, David, we talk about, you know, about how do you make sure that you don't leave any white space for disruption? And some of this goes back to listening to customers and, yeah, and look, it, you know, and you're, you're absolutely right. Amazon has uh, has changed the landscape, uh, you know, for many consumers. And you know, and we talk about, uh, you know, so let's use home delivery today. And you know, we we think that we've made it, you know, pretty convenient for customers today. Today, uh, you, you got more than seventy percent of the U.S. population that lives within, you know, three miles of a CVS, and you know. Uh, a vast majority of our stores have drive-throughs, so you can you know get a prescription without ever getting out of your car if that's your priority. We have mail order uh, services. We now have home delivery. So, 
you know, it, David, a lot of people have talked about omnichannel, and we're sitting here today saying, well, we offer that omni experience that you can be whoever you want to be based on the priority at that point in time. And look, we're, we're thinking about uh, the journey that we're on. We're defining what omni-channel means for health, if you think about it that way as well. Yeah, I, I love the consumer focus. Fantastic. You know, Larry, this has been so much fun. And I want to have a little bit more before I let you go here. And I want to do a little lightning round here with you. Okay. So what three words would best describe you? Uh, that's passionate. Uh, uh, sometimes, well, I, that, that'd be four words. I'd say passionate, <laughs> in, passionate, impatient, and humble. All right. If you could take the place of one person for a day, who would it be? Um, David, I grew up in Western Pennsylvania and, uh, I had uh, such admiration for Arnold Palmer. And I say that because I, uh, I'm not a good golfer. I like golf, but, uh, I see, uh, Mr. Palmer as, you know, someone who excelled, you know, as a professional athlete, but someone who also excelled as a business person and an entrepreneur. And someone who never forgot uh, his roots, never forgot where he came from, and had expressed uh, an element of humility that I, I, I actually got to meet him once. And I got to speak to him for about 10 minutes. And at the end of 10 minutes, I felt like I knew him for 20 years. He made you that comfortable. You know, and uh, what would be something that, you know, few people would know about you, Larry? Uh, well, uh, David, um, uh, I actually uh, uh, was a musician. Uh, I thought, I actually thought about majoring in music. And I, uh, as I was going through grade school, junior and, and, and senior high school, I played the piano, the flute, uh, the saxophone, and uh, uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. It, 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 helped, uh, it helped pay for part of my college uh, you know, expenses. And uh, I still play the piano, but uh, you know, I, I think back to those days fondly. I, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I do believe that you know, music taught me discipline. Uh, and I, I think a lot about that. You know, I remember playing the saxophone uh, for about six months. <laughs> do, 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 do you have a, a hidden talent? Uh, I don't, I, you know what? I, I'm not a very good athlete. Okay. I, I'm a wannabe athlete. Uh, you know, probably the music is what I would describe that as my, is my hidden talent. Larry, you've had so much success, but you know, a lot of leaders have a, what they would call their epic fail or, or certainly a failure. What would be your biggest failure that you've had and, and what'd you learn from it? Uh, you know what, David, there's two things that, that come to mind. And, you know, we, we talked a lot about listening to our customers and, you know, and I can remember, oh God, uh, this is probably maybe 20 years ago, maybe even a little further than that. You know, the, we, we saw one of our competitors uh, opening up drive through windows for, for the pharmacy. And, and, and I can remember saying, well, we can't do that. Well, what do you mean we can't do that? Well, if, if they go through the drive through you know, they won't come inside the store. Okay. And, and the learning from that was, well, look, if they want to use the drive through and you don't have it, then they're not going to come <laughs> to the store anyway because they're going to go to somebody who does. And, right. and, and, and that was an important learning that, you know, if you, you got to meet the needs of the consumer, you know, or they'll find someone who does. And the second thing that comes to mind in that is, you know, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, about innovation and, and I think that um, this is probably a, a bigger issue than an individual failure. As, as, as an organization, you know, we would sit here and talk, we have a wonderful culture. And, uh, but you know, why are we so slow at innovating? And, and what we realized was, well, th there's fear of failure because of you know, our culture gets in the way of you know, our culture supports that kind of success and people want to do the right things. And, but we haven't made it easy for people to fail. And mm. years ago, David, we, you know, we, we talked a lot about that as an organization. Uh, and, and, you know, and I, and I still remember in a town hall meeting where we gave a, an award uh, to someone, you know, who failed on a project. Okay. And, 
you could have heard a pin drop in the room, okay? And it was symbolic of what I was just describing. Uh, and, uh, and we talked about the learnings from that failure and how that, that failure was really a success. And that was really where we started talking about that if we're not failing on some things, we're not pushing the envelope enough and we'll celebrate failure as long as you know, we meet three criteria. Fail fast, <laughs> fail cheaply, and fail on something new. And, 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 and I'm happy to say that we've gotten better, although, I, David, I, I, you know, we, we talked about the pandemic a minute ago, and one of the things that we just did this as a leadership team about, uh, about a week ago, and I said earlier I couldn't have been prouder of you know, uh, our organization in terms of you know, how folks stepped up. But one of the things that I know several of our senior leaders spoke up and said, man, we were quick in terms of making decisions and moving. And someone made the comment that, you know what, we, we rolled out things that, you know, we didn't, they, they weren't fully baked, you know, and we had a 75%, 80% solution and we knew it, but we went with it anyway. And we iterated the balance along the way. And there was a really good learning that came from that, that uh, if we had waited to get it to 90 or 95%, then uh, we, we perhaps would have missed you know, meeting the need of consumers. Another big issue in our country today is opioids. And, and you've taken the lead on this front as well. Yeah, uh, David, it, it, look, it, it, it's, uh, you know, we, we've all seen uh, the pain and frustration around that, that, you know, it's a situation that, uh, that doesn't discriminate. Uh, it's in the cities, it's in the suburbs, it's in rural America. And this is a good example of, uh, I remember one of the first things that we did was uh, empty out your medicine cabinet. And we didn't know what to expect when we did that. We were doing these drug take-back programs. And uh, all of a sudden, the quantities that were coming back, it was like, well, by the time we empty every medicine cabinet in America, it'll be time to start over again because we haven't solved, for, it, it, it kind of gets back to what's the problem that we're solving for. And at the time, we didn't have a solution for why is this product getting in the medicine cabinet to begin with? And when we realized that, we went back and and one of the things that we found in, in Probably everybody has an example of that, that you know, whether it's going to the dentist or somebody has an acute injury and they walk away with a, with a prescription for you know, 30 or 60 pain pills. And the reality is you know, they might need you know, six or eight uh, because it's, it's acute short-term pain. Uh, and those unused quantities is what was ending up in the medicine cabinet. And unfortunately, those were becoming a source for how people were entering the opioid world to begin with. So one of the actions that we took is, uh, you know, if, uh, if someone was new to therapy, you know, we were not going to dispense uh, any more than a seven-day supply. And and look, we over, over the last few, last several years, we've seen a dramatic decrease in both the number as well as the quantity of opioid prescriptions uh, that we have dispensed. And look, we think that that's made a, a meaningful improvement. But you know, look, we, we still have a lot of work to do there. Uh, our pharmacists have gone into communities. We we've gone in and, and done. Uh, our pharmacists have gone into schools and have now touched more than a half a million students in terms of talking about, you know, the dangers of prescription drug abuse. That's great. Well, Larry, one thing for sure, you have a tremendous talent of building a tremendous business. And, uh, you know, I don't know of anybody who's, who's grown their business $150 billion in revenue in nine years. That's, that's really, really something. And uh, so hats off. Uh, just one last question here. You know, what would you say about your upbringing and, and just your personal family situation that, that, that uh, is really driving who you are today? Uh, Dave, I, th- you know, I think about my, my upbringing and uh, look, I, I was fortunate to be the first uh, member of my family to go to college. And my parents, they taught me the value of a strong work ethic and the value associated with um, 
being a good human being, I've always worked hard to do that. And uh, I think embedded in there is it was something that struck me back to speaking about Arnold Palmer. And one of those things I believe in is, you know, don't forget where you came from. And in thinking about individuals that had an impact on on your life, whether it's in your business life or your personal life, and the responsibility that we have as adults and as business leaders to pay that forward. And my wife and I have one child and we're proud of her as well. And I see those, those values in her as well. So that's something that, uh, that I take a lot of pride in. Well, fantastic, Larry. You know, this has just been amazing. And uh, thank you for sharing your insights with, uh, with other leaders. There's so much we can all learn. So thank you very much. Now, David, enjoy doing it. Enjoy the discussion. You know, I can't think of a better example of how a simple and compelling purpose transformed a company. But it just didn't happen. Larry first had to throw out the convoluted missions and visions of the past. He had to dial in to something simple and compelling, something people could really get on board with, and something that people could relate to and and make tough decisions and actually bring that purpose statement to life. This week, as part of your weekly personal development plan, I want you to do something a little scary. I want you to just stop casually in the hall or ping some of your people on Slack and just ask them, hey, without looking it up, what's our organization's purpose? Or ask them, what's the purpose of our team? Ask a few more people, listen to their responses, and then see for yourself how well, or maybe how not so well, your vision is coming through to your team and your organization. You might find there's an opportunity to simplify your organization's vision and purpose too. And hey, like CVS Health, there may be a whole new level of success waiting for you out there when you do. So do you want to know how leaders lead? What we learned today is that great leaders craft a simple and compelling purpose that their people can actually act upon. Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of How Leaders Lead, where every Thursday you get to listen in while I interview some of the very best leaders in the world. I make it a point to give you something simple on each episode that you can apply to your business so that you will become the best leader you can be.